G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as we continue this series we have going on the channel of reviewing one club at a time. Uh, what I'm doing is sort of breaking down each team's best 22 uh, with a little bit of context as to the 2023 season, how their off season went, and potentially as well, analyzing their strengths and weaknesses and giving a little bit of, uh, of a prediction, I suppose, as to how their 2024 season might go. If you're unaware, I've been doing this series uh, reverse alphabetically, which means that I started with the Western Bulldogs uh, and all the way through to Melbourne was the last video earlier today. And then uh, now we're doing the Hawthorne Football Club. The Hawks, uh, like a few others, uh, another interesting list management case study. You know, over the last six, seven years, what we've seen from the Hawks is them really doing things their own way. And what I mean by that is just sort of being aggressive in their pursuits. So pro post that, you know, three-peat era, they sort of aggressively traded for players like Jay Gromira and Tom Mitchell. Um, and then uh, subsequently, when that failed to yield another premiership window, they've been aggressive again at uh, undertaking a proper rebuild through the draft. And today's video, I suppose, is sort of assessing uh, exactly where I think they're at. So uh, if you're looking for other clubs that I've done um, in terms of this type of video, I do have a playlist on the channel called Team Based Videos for 2024. And uh, as well, you can just go back and look at the bunch of other videos. So if you are enjoying the content that I'm putting on the channel, it would mean a lot if you could subscribe to the channel. But all right, let's talk about the Hawthorne Footy Club, starting with um, you know how 2023 went, and it's an interesting one with uh, assessing how the 2023 went, uh, season went for the Hawks. When you consider they actually went backwards in terms of wins and losses, and yet most people would agree that Hawthorne probably took some really big strides this year. At the end of 22, they made again some aggressive moves. They've offloaded players that they previously aggressively traded for in Tom Mitchell and Jago O'Meara, uh, offloaded them to other clubs. As such, there was a bit of conjecture as to how their young midfield would go. They seemed to be embracing the possibility of a, a stint down the ladder, but they defied those odds. And, uh, you know, funnily enough, their midfield was a relative strength for them in 2023 with a, a very strong core group of young midfielders. Specifically, I think the, the engine room that we saw this year uh, was, you know, Jai Newcomb, uh, All-Australian squad, had a brilliant season, only played 50 games. James Warple as well. Will Day is another one that's probably taken a, a, a few steps in 2023. 23 transitioning from more of a defender to kind of a midfielder slash defender and potentially just a midfielder from now on. Connor Nash is another player that had a really good season. It's quite a young midfielder at that. The forward line had some, some winners. You know, Mitch Lewis from the 15 games we saw, he kicked 36 goals and in my opinion, Shapes is a really important cog of them potentially moving up the ladder in future years. Luke Bruce also is worth acknowledging for a brilliant season as a veteran small forward. So when you assess, you know, how some of the performances went for Hawthorne this year, it's it's interesting. The Jekyll and Hyde side, it has to be said. You know, uh, I think when they played West Coast at uh, Launceston sort of in the first third of the season, at that point, they were 18th on the ladder, if I'm not mistaken. And that was going to be considered a fairly good game. But I think that was the game where Hawthorne kind of announced to everyone that they're well and truly a streets ahead of the actual bottom teams this year, which turned out to be West Coast and North Melbourne. When they smashed West Coast into oblivion. Blast us into oblivion. Further to that, we also saw some good wins later in the year. They beat Collingwood, they beat the Brisbane Lions, uh, the MCG, they beat St Kilda and the Western Bulldogs. Three of those sides made finals, two of them made the grand final, and the Western Bulldogs probably should have made the grand final. But, you know, you consider some of the other, you know, lackluster performances this year. There was, uh, of the week after they beat the Saints, they conceded 16 goals and a half to Port Adelaide and then uh, won the second half of that game. And then after beating the Brisbane Lions at the MCG, they got smashed to the, by the Gold Coast by 67 points. So uh, the, the data there would suggest that the gap between their best and worst is still something they've got to work out. And I'm also thinking of that uh, final game of the year at the MCG against Fremantle, where we didn't see the best Hawks come to play. But that is understandable. They're a young group. We're just sort of mapping out what this season looked like. So before I have a crack at plotting their best 22, let's go through the list changes. And this was fairly extensive. They had 10 list cuts this year, uh, either by delisting, retirement or trade or whatever. So those include Tyler Brockman to West Coast, Jacob Kaczynski to Richmond, Brandon Ryan to Hawthorne, uh, Emerson Jacker they delisted and he's been re-rookied by Geelong. Max Lynch unfortunately retired. Then there's Lockie Bramble, Fergus Green, Ned Long, Josh Morris, and Fionn, Finn, Finn O'Hara. Forgive me if I'm saying that wrong. In terms of the additions, they were also pretty active in this space. Jack Ginevan, obviously signed from Collingwood. Marbio Chol from the Gold Coast Suns. Jack Gunston returned from the Brisbane Lions. And they got Massimo D'Ambrosio as well from the Essendon Footy Club. Then they enjoyed a, a fairly good draft, uh, getting Nick Watson, uh, Will McCabe, their father-son prospect. They needed a KPD, a key position defender. They got one. Bodie Ryan, the uh, running defender, I think, from South Australia. And their father-son, key forward prospect in Colshadir as well. So with that mapped out, I've had an attempt 
at their best 22. These are not simple. Again, I'm uh, broadcasting. I'm an Eagles fan, an outsider looking in, but this is sort of a, a helpful exercise to see what I think their strengths and weaknesses are. So that's the team I'm running with, and I've got the t- uh, the new players, sorry, in yellow. So you can see I've included Ginevan, I've included Jack Gunston, I've included Marbior Chol on the bench there, and I am chucking in Nick Watson because I think he should play early. But what strikes me about this team is it is incredibly young. Look, that midfield in particular, obviously with Will Day, Newcomb, and Warple is a, is a pretty young on-ball division. i got Connor Nash on the bench, but obviously it doesn't really matter. It's just a little bit hard to separate some of them. And the wingers in Ward and Amon. The forward line is really like the probably arguably the most compelling part of their team. I think maybe statistically their, for, their midfield is their strength, but I think going into this year with the return of Gunston and then some uh, reinforcements in Chol, uh, the Mitchell is potentially playing a full season. Ginevan as well, in addition to Luke Bruce having a fantastic year. I do think they boast a very balanced forward line in terms of the ways that they can hurt you. They've got a good, really strong, quality tall in Mitch Lewis. If you extrapolate how last season went, he could be a 50, 60 goal forward going forward and entering the prime of his career. We know Gunston's probably going to be reliable, probably. But if he's not, there's still other options there. Uh, with Dylan Moore, a great high half forward there. Connor McDonald, an underrated gun of the comp. Uh, it's a really dangerous forward line and again, still pretty young. Uh, I think I said this in the podcast. It's interesting. Not many of the players in that forward six, as good as it is, are actually in their prime. So you've got Bruce and Gunston at the back end of the careers. Ginevan probably a little bit pre his prime. Chol maybe in his prime. Nick Watson's young. Connor McDonald's uh, young. Dylan Moore's probably in his prime too. So there's just a really good blend of youth and talent and experience there. The back six, other than potentially a second key, uh, key back alongside Sicily, this was uh, fairly simple. I think it is a relative strength to them as well. I've got GF coming back from injury, slotting onto a halfback flank. Scrimshaw uh, played pretty well last year. Really good uh, efficiency by foot. Jarman Impey's in that team. Blake Hardwick's obviously a walk-up start. The, the second KPD uh, spot I gave to Blank, but that was probably going to be an interesting battle between Blank and Frost. I'm not sure exactly who lines up there round one, but that was probably be my choice. Uh, but then uh, there's a few other options you could mention. Bailey McDonald, I think, is probably going to be one player that gets into this team throughout the year, allowing for injuries, etc. But I didn't have him ahead of Josh Weddle, who uh, had a fantastic debut season. I've also given a bench spot to Finn McGuinness as well as a target, which again, adds a lot of balance to, um, to that midfield. So it's a very balanced team. There's a few other players sort of like knocking down the door to some extent or players that we think will feature. Uh, you know, Bailey McDonald, I just mentioned. Se- Seamus Mitchell was hard to leave out. Sam Frost and Massimo D'Ambrosio. I'm not sure exactly where he starts, but I couldn't slot him into this team. Uh, as for the young mids, there's Cam McKenzie, there's Henry Hustwaite, a couple of players that played footy this year and uh, are good enough to get games next year, you'd think. It's just that they didn't quite make the cut. But again, a best 22 is idealistic and it relies on no one being injured. That being said, I have left out Chad Wingard because of his Achilles injury. If he was fully fit and raring to go, maybe he starts ahead of Ginnivan. Um, but, you know, either way, I think uh, I think he's going to find it tough to crack in next year. Uh, I suppose that's why he's been delisted and, well, not read rookie He went through the preseason draft. Not really sure why. Uh, as for forwards, they've got a few options. Sam Butler was probably the next forward, if I'm not mistaken, as the player that I uh, left out. Uh, then there's Granger Brass, who they've now sort of shifted from being a key defender into more of a key forward. And then um, we'll see how that goes. Obviously, there's still a big question mark. Max Ramsden is another option they have, uh, having seen Brandon Ryan go to the Brisbane Lions. So generally speaking, like I said, it's a very balanced team. There's midfield prowess both inside and out. Uh, If there's any comment on the midfield, it's just the lack of experience. So Warple's 24, Nash is 25, Amon's 28. Those are by far the three most experienced, or the, the oldest midfielders that they have. Newcomb is one of their best players, only played 50 games. So... I wouldn't say it's a vulnerability, but it's an interesting observation for sure. I think the the back line, aside from another great key defender like James Sicily is, uh, he is also very undersized. He's only 187 centimeters. So um, I think nailing that other position is, is going to be of importance to them. But other than that, I think there's really good rebound skills, run and carry out of that team. And I think in terms of top line potential, I'm still a big fan of Will Day and what he could potentially produce as a uh, as a full, full-time full midfielder going forward. I think we've seen good development from him. Uh, and there's a really good balance of scoring power, height in the forward line as well. So the Hawks, I think, are in a good position to just give games on merit this year uh, because some of their alternatives are also young developing players. So they don't really need to go out there with a focus on giving games to certain players. They've really refreshed, refreshed their list over the years. And of course, they're in a position now where their competition for best 22 uh, probably breeds a much healthier list as a result. So I usually include a, a little segment about you know ongoing needs, what a Hawthorne need to address going forward with this particular team. 
like I said, it's well balanced and there's not a lot of uh, vulnerabilities in that list that, other than just experience. So I think we could even see another inconsistent year for them. But I would probably just go another key position defender in an ideal world. I do know that they try to trade for Daniel Curtin and uh, they were interested in Connor Rose Sullivan, according to uh, Cal Toomey. They tried to trade for Curtin, but they did get Will McCabe. He's going to take a little while. Uh, but there's also to consider that Sicily turns 29 this year. So, um, you know, backfilling him in a few years is going to be important because he might be... Well, he could, he could be one of these players that plays to 34. We'll see. But something to consider. Uh, and, and I think with Hawthorne, it's just a matter of time for them to wait and see what midfield talent uh, emerges to be absolute A-graders. Like I said, uh, Will Day, I think, has that top-line potential. Josh Ward is another one who was a top-10 pick, as was Cam McKenzie and Josh Weddle as well. Whether he develops as a defender or as a midfielder, like some have suggested, will be interesting. But they've got some options there. It's not a case of them needing to go out into the market and get anything. I think a lot of their talent is just about there. It's just about nurturing it properly. I would argue that Mitch Lewis is quite central to their, their hopes of really challenging in the next three or four years. His career um, a development is, is going to be quite pivotal, and I think they could even use a longer-term partner with him. Obviously, Chol could kind of go either way. Gunson's at the back end. Um, you know, Drafting someone or tr trading in someone who can be a good one-two punch with Mitch Lewis doesn't have to be as good as Mitch Lewis. Uh, but making the, a dynamic duo, so to speak, I think they will need to cover for that position in a few years. By comparison, I think they're probably well-placed to cover guys like Wingard and even Bruce. As good as, as Bruce has been, and particularly last season, uh, they've got some small talent there. So um, that's not going to be a pressing need. So to summarize uh, you know, how I think 2024 is going to go, like I said, they were very Jekyll and Hyde this year. Um, some, some really strong performances and some performances where it didn't really feel like they showed up. Uh, but again, this is to be expected of young teams. I just think this team is probably still young enough that we can expect that again, to some extent in 2024. And so backing them in for a finals berth is probably something I'm not willing to do yet, but I do see the potential. And I think the reason why is they've got this dangerous forward line that I think has the potential to really pile on goals to the opposition. And uh, like I said, can hurt you in multiple ways, aerially at ground level, there's good skills there, there's, there's versatility there. So I do think that if their midfield gets on top and I think their midfield is talented enough, you know, they're a strong clearance side, particularly if they stay fit, if their midfield is establishing some sort of dominance in a game, their forward prowess, I think, has the potential to really cut teams up. So it, to use an Eagles example, it kind of reminds me of what we were like in maybe like 2014. We did miss the finals that year. It felt like for our team, uh, our midfield was weak, but our forward line was so good that we had the potential to either get smacked because our forwards weren't getting any opportunity or they were efficient enough to really pile on goals when our midfield was breaking even. And I think Hawthorne, I mean, they don't have a prime Josh Kennedy like West Coast did, but they, I think they've got some really, really strong avenues and varied avenues where their forward line, I think, could really put teams away this year. But again, I would still expect some performances where Hawthorne quite, aren't quite the full measure. But if they are, it, I'll be incredibly impressed. If they are a consistent team next year in Sam Mitchell's second season, I'll be blown away. But I do think also, you know, from the outside looking in, the, the pressure's still not really on Hawthorne to, to succeed just yet. Um, so they could have the freedom to finish bottom four again. And I think they're still going to be, you know, relatively comfortable with where the list is at. Um, you know, barring, you know, individuals having terrible seasons. So that, that's a little bit different. But I don't think there's immediate pressure to, to rise up the ladder. And I think we could see a year where they have a similar year to last year, maybe some mild improvements. Uh, but I think 2025, they're another team, um, maybe like the Gold Coast Suns, who will shoot into the eight. So for me, it's Hawthorne and probably a year away from finals, um, but I could be wrong on that because I do see a lot of potential there. So let me know in the comment section what I got right or wrong, guys. I'm sure, again, I'm, I haven't nailed the best 22 perfectly, uh, but you know, I, I do generally research what people are saying out there with regard to the best 22. And, um, you know, there's still a lot of subjectivity with this team as well. Um, so there's no clear cut answer, but that was just my thoughts. I know we have a lot of Hawks fans that uh, support the channel as well. So I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to getting your input, guys. So thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And I'll see you in the next video.